uh, a couple, uh, well, a few years ago, the Lord really impacted my heart and, and the heart of my wife, Rosie, with the importance, uh, uh, I should say, renew, uh, renew to us the importance of giving ourselves to, to prayer and worship um, through different prophetic words, um, instructions, divine appointments. God really has just led us and brought us to where we are today, where we have established a, a, a prayer um, house, um, prayer room, Jamaica House of Prayer. And during that time, God has made for us divine connections. And, and, and I can't go into it to explain you know, what I mean by that, other than that they were not planned by us. One, of the, one day we were driving out of Trenchtown, we received a call from California and somebody was um, you know, just inquiring about Jamaica House of Prayer and uh, what we were about and um, well they knew something about what we were about but they wanted to link up with us. Um, cutting a long story short, we ended up um, you know making contact with the Pasadena House of Pasadena International House of Prayer, um, Pi Hop for short. And uh, God has so ordered it that we should have a conference and that these brethren would would come. Ten, it was originally fourteen. It came. Ten of them eventually came, and they just had in their hearts this desire to come and bless us. So they have paid their own way. They have paid their, all their expenses, all of that, to come and help us. Um, I having this vision in my heart for a conference because there is a word that God is just downloading to us that we want to communicate to the body of Christ. And so we asked them to come. We had the conference here at Christian Life Fellowship. Praise God for those who were able to come and be a part of it. And um, this morning, for those who were not able to come or did not come, you know, you say if you can't bring them people to the mountain, you bring the mountain to the people. So this morning... I am pleased to present to you the, the founder of the Pasadena International House of Prayer, that is um, Cheryl Allen. She's going to share with us or from her heart some of the things that God has placed on her heart. I, I've been so blessed by just hearing her own experience of setting up a house of prayer, that it is not an easy road and that there are challenges but praise God for his grace and his goodness. For he has a plan and he's fulfilling his plan. So without further ado, our sister Cheryl Ale. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure being here. It feels like home. I, you guys, just the hospitality and just the open-heartedness of everyone that we've encountered, it's just been such a blessing. I'm really humbled to be up here just because the richness of who you are. I've experienced just such deep understanding of the word since being here, such a richness of prayer in this house. So I'm just so grateful to be here. I know the team has been just so blessed. So thank you so much. And may this just be an encouraging time. May the Lord just use me to speak just encouragement to you as well as um, just a little bit of our story, my story, that it might may inspire you. Um, I, before we do, though, I love to just worship right before I speak. So we're going to do it. <laughs> so we'll just, let's just, um, just worship the Lord, just put our gaze upon him, and then um, I'll share.
like a melody in your heart. So God, we're just doing this even now, God, right before your throne, right before your face. Our eyes are upon you. And we lift up our voice. And we sing a song that only we can bring to you. A sound that only we can sing to you.
his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And his timing is not our timing. He is patient. And as we worship, it's like we enter into the realm, the eternal realm, where there is no end and there is no beginning. And he just causes us to just come in and just rest in that place and let go of all of our anxiety and let go of all our plotting, all our planning, and just to be with him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And so just even that was just a little taste of just what is day and night worship. Because something that the Lord is doing in the earth, and it's not stoppable. I I got involved in this about 12 years ago, in in the year 2000. I guess it's now 13 years ago. And um, then it was just, there was a room in Kansas City, and there were 100 people in it. And it never stopped. There were always 100 people in it. Sometimes there were 20 people in it at 2 o'clock in the morning. But it just continued. And... I had been a Christian all of my life, and I had um, been raised in the church, went to a a Christian university called Biola University, and um, had done a lot of different work with the Lord, had been involved in inner city ministry, and really felt like, you know, the calling of God on my life. And I was like, God, I, I know you have a purpose for me. And I know you want me to do something really awesome for you, right? And so I went to Kansas City in the in in 2000, and I saw this, and I was like, "Wow, it's this, you know, this house of prayer that where there's this continuous worship." There were 18 year olds that knew the Bible in ways I just was stunned by, just the way it came out of their heart as they sang. And I was like, that's awesome. But you know what? I'm called to more. I'm going to make impact. And this isn't that impactful. It's in a room and it's kind of hidden. And I was like, God, I don't think this is what I'm called to. I love this. It's awesome. But I feel like I'm made for more. And within the next three months, the Lord just began to show me, like, Cheryl, this is what I'm calling you to. And, um... I was a little disappointed just because I thought, do you know who I am? You know, I could do a lot for you. (laughs) And um, at the same time, he was he was breaking my heart. He goes, he said, Cheryl, I I have designed you for this. And you know what? I did it in faith initially, because, again, I kind of thought, well, maybe I'll do this for a year, but I'm going to move on and make some major impact. And now it's 13 years later, and I am still there. And I realized that this is what the Lord is doing in this hour. Because 13 years ago, this was a very foreign concept of people staying in a room and just worshiping the Lord and praying to the Lord. And yet, now it's filling the earth. I, just in the United States alone, there's 3,000 houses of prayer. 3,000. Now, not all of them are going 24-7 because that's not necessarily the purpose. It's the idea of what we just did in this room, just now. This lingering worship where we're not in a hurry. That's the main purpose of saying, God, we're not in a hurry. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I felt like I'm going to share some of my story, but I'm also going to encourage you. Because how many of you have been given promises from the Lord? Raise your hand. I know everyone here, right? (laughs) How many of you are still waiting for those promises to be fulfilled? You are in good company. (laughs) Because this is part of... God's way is that God gives promises and then he causes us to wait. He causes us to wait. And I felt like just the scripture that the Lord highlighted just as I even came into the room today. He just gave me Psalm 27, verse 13 and verse 14. He said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. 
Be of good courage and wait. Oh, I think normally we think of be of good courage and do something. But he said, no, be of good courage and wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And I feel like the Lord just wanted to encourage many of you today that part of the way that God does things, he has done it forever. This is not a new principle. It has been always. He gives the vision. He gives the promise. And then he causes us to wait. He has never given vision and given promise and then done it immediately. Ever. I think he should, but he doesn't. He doesn't. And he, he one day woke me up in the middle of the night and he said, the people plot in vain. They try to make it happen before me. They try to make it happen, but don't do that. Wait, I say, wait on me. The posture I'm looking for is a waiting heart. And that, my friends, is the heart of prayer. Who, who has now, because you know what he said, he used a, he used a song that was popular uh, maybe in the 90s. It was a song um, by the Cranberries, and he started to sing it to me. He says, do you have to let it linger? Do you have to let it linger? I've got you wrapped around my little finger. And he said, Cheryl, the reason why I enjoy waiting is because I want a people that are wrapped around my little finger. I want a people completely, utterly dependent upon me. And guess what? There's nothing like waiting that creates dependency. It guarantees weakness. It guarantees weakness. And guess what? God exalts the weak. God exalts the humble. He cannot exalt the ones who think they can do it. Once given the vision that they can make it happen. That's not what God gives vision for. He gives you vision so you know that you cannot do it. You are completely, utterly dependent upon him. Unless he does it, it does not happen. <laughs> It's hard. <laughs> I know for me, the Lord gave vision, and then I thought, okay, amen. This is a good vision. Let's do this. And now, years later, and I'm thinking, I don't think I could ever do it. In fact, I don't even know if I want to do it. In fact, I don't even know if I really like it anymore, right? <laughs> That's how the Lord wants us when he gives the promise fulfilled. He de desires us more of him and less of us. Therefore, he always gives a promise that we cannot fulfill. The promise that he has given you, there is no way for you to do it. Even for these ones who are, who are starting this house of prayer, how can this be? How can this place be filled with 24-7 worship? It seems too much. <laughs> And yet, he is able. He is able. So in, for me, it started in 2001. I was hired by a leader. He asked me, his name's Lou Engel. He asked me to, to be involved in this night watch and that I would do midnight to two. <laughs> I was a full-time teacher, so I, I taught third grade. So um, I would... <laughs> I said yes. You know why I said yes? Because the Lord had been working on my heart. I said, okay, yes, I want to do this. I want to do midnight to two every night. So it changes your life when you say midnight to two and you have to be at work very early in the morning. So what happens is I, I, I split up my schedule of sleep. I sleep a little bit before. I sleep a little bit after. I wake up and then go to work. And then sometimes when you're working with children, there's a need for patience. <laughs> so sleep is good. <laughs> sleep is really good. But he gives grace. And so I would be, I, sometimes I felt like I leaned against the board sometimes to stay steady. But, um, but the Lord began to just change my life through that schedule. Because I didn't have time to do many other things. I worked and I prayed. <laughs> it really changed me. Like there weren't time for all the extraneous other things. It was either work or prayer. 
And what happened in the midst of that is the Lord began to make promises to me. And I didn't know I was going to be a leader. By the way, I never said, I want to start a house of prayer. Never said that. I just was hired to do this night watch. Like, I did midnight to two, another guy did two to six. And we just oversaw a room, we played CDs, and, you know, it was really beautiful. The first night that we do this, the Lord gives me a dream. And in the dream, the, he's, he, I'm in a courtroom, and there's these, these men and women, and they've all used my name for counterfeit purposes. And they're tied up, they're gagged, and they're blindfolded, and they're raging mad. They're so angry. They're all bound, and they're angry. And I'm in this courtroom thinking, I don't think I'm going to have to speak. I don't even think my lawyer is going to have to speak. It's so obvious. These people are guilty. And so I, um, I'm standing there. These two women in white come up, and they begin to minister to me in the courtroom. And then this man named Mr. Blue which a lot of times blue represents like revelation. I love that God's being so obvious to me, maybe because I need help. He's, <laughs> he comes up to me and he says, the Lord says to you, you are his Esther. And I'm slain in the spirit. That has never happened before. It has never happened again. It's, it was for this moment. And it's my first night in the house of prayer as I'm beginning to posture myself in this place of just standing before the Lord. And I ask the Lord when I wake up from the dream, God, what does this mean? You know, I know Esther for such a time as this. I know Esther, if I die, I die. And I know that she makes an impact for her nation. But I ask God, why? What, what do you want from this? And that's such a good question when you wake up from a dream that you know is from the Lord. Just to ask him. Because the reason why God gives dreams, why God gives riddles, while God gives visions, is because he longs for intimacy. And you know what? If we could figure it all out, we wouldn't come to him. So he's like, I give these riddles, I give these parables, I give these things that don't seem so clear so you would come to me. Because he's always wooing us to himself. So I ask him and he goes, Cheryl, you don't ha when you come to me every night, don't come and, and make your petitions known. You don't have to present a case before me. I want you to banquet me every night. The same way Esther banqueted the king, just give me a banquet. And you know what? <laughs> that is what I've done for 13 years. It's just give the Lord a banquet. And you know, by giving him a banquet, it has kept me in a place of consistency. Because just giving petitioning prayers is not what the Lord is only after. He's mainly after the relationship. That we are completely dependent upon him. And what he's crying out for is those who would first minister to him. Minister to him. One of the things when later in, in 2002, this was in 2001. In 2002, he gives, this, he gives me an understanding that he's going to give me five dreams in five nights. And he said, these will be the blueprints of the house of prayer. And the reason why I want to share them is because... I believe it gives you an, it just opens up your heart to see what is this thing called house of prayer. I pray a lot in my prayer closet. I pray a lot with my little intercession group. I pray a lot with a lot of people. Why do we need a place called the house of prayer? Aren't we supposed to do that in secret? And so I, I, I want to give you just through what he shared with me. He said five dreams and five nights, and they started that night. Again, that's... I wish I could say, and then yesterday he told me he's going to get, no, he doesn't do this. He only has done this once with me. <laughs> and so this was this, these five dreams. And the first dream, he, um, Mike Bickle, who's the founder of IHOP, was in the dream. And he was teaching me the Song of Solomon. And he was tutoring me. And so he was watching everything I wrote. And he made sure I wrote out down every single word. So here I am writing him down, and then he says something I don't like, so I don't write it down. He said, why didn't you write that down? I said, I don't want to write devotion dies in longing. He said, I didn't say dies, I said pies. So I write P-Y-E-S. Never seen that word before? Never. 
And so I, I write it down, and then I write this woman's name down, Simone Wiel. Never seen that name before. So I wake up from the dream, and this is pre-Google, okay? No, no Google. So um, <laughs> maybe there's Google, and I just don't know about it. I think I had an AOL account at the time. And um, <laughs> so I, I, I look in my dictionary. Yes, I did. There's a dictionary under my bed, and God even knows your dictionary. That's what's so crazy. Because I have looked in other dictionaries, and this word is not in other dictionaries. But this word is in my dictionary. <laughs> and it's P-Y-E-S. Look it up. It's a set of rules used in the pre-Reformation church to determine the correct order of worship. Whoa. You're like, what? What? You know, you're so like, whoa, God is speaking. And what is it? It's Song of Solomon. Why is it Song of Solomon? Because the Lord is looking for more than servants. He desires those who love him with all of their heart, with all of their mind, with all of their soul, and with all of their strength. He's looking for lovers. He's not just looking for servants. He desires a people who will love him the same way the Father loves him, who will love the Father the same way the Father lo that Jesus loves the Father. That's what he's longing for, to come forth out of the bride in this hour of history. And so he's saying, I'm going to woo you. I'm going to put you in a wilderness called a prayer room where you wait on my promises. And you know what's going to happen in that midst? I'm going to romance you with me. You're going to be so enthralled with me that it won't, even be, it won't even matter about the promises anymore because I have been now the one who fascinates you. And so that is what the prayer room is about. It's not about just getting answers. It is about becoming in love, that we would be in love and we would be betrothed to him. <laughs> Ones who are fully given to the Lord. And it's not, because it says when you're in love, you don't, you don't calculate. You don't try to count costs. No, 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 no. When you're in love, you do reckless things. Yes, you do. You stay up all night. <laughs> you stay up all night. You spend money you don't have. You do things that you don't. <laughs> You do this because you're in love. It's not because you're just trying to say, oh, wow, well, if I serve them enough. No, no, it's because your heart is so enthralled. That's why you're doing it. And that's what this is about. The house of prayer isn't just about getting answers. It's about becoming in love. Isn't that awesome? And you know what's so fun is that he, this Simone Weil word, so I'm, I'm, I'm with Lou Engel, I'm sharing the five dreams, and I look to the side of me, like while I'm telling it, you know how God would have you do that. You're just kind of looking, your eyes kind of going there, and he has this bookshelf, and there's that name. And I pull it out, he goes, and I know this is crazy, but if you know who Lou Engel is, it's not that crazy. So I pull him out, I pull it out, and he goes, I just bought that book. He bought it that day. And then he goes, I didn't, I looked at it and I thought, I'll never read that book. So I put it in my bookshelf. So then I pull it out and the book is called The Need for Roots. And you know what it is? We need to be rooted and established in love. And guess what? There was this woman called Mary of Bethany. And you know what? She sat at his feet. And you know what happens when you sit at his feet? Roots begin to grow. Roots begin to grow. Yeah, the sitting at his feet, it's not running around, driving in your car, praying, rushing and eating breakfast and praying under your breath. No, no, no. No, roots begin to grow when you sit at his feet. You let go of everything else, and there's just a sitting and a listening and a sitting and a listening. Isn't that awesome? And that is what God is desiring because there's something about a house of prayer too that it, as you do it together, you're encouraged because you see others doing it with you. And you know what? It's also becoming a voice that's crying out in the wilderness. God is worthy to be loved. <laughs> we don't just come to service because we want to be encouraged. We come to a house of prayer because we want to love him. We want to minister to him. 
<laughs> Amen. Okay. So the next dream had to do with, um, it's a long dream. It has a little bit of just personal stuff because it gave timing about us going forward. So um, in the dream, this, it's a really fun dream though. I'll, okay, I'll try to explain it. So this, I'm, I'm leaving a house and I'm coming into a new house. And in the dream, there's these two people in that house. There's a woman named Ann House. Yes, that is her name, Ann House. And when she's in my dream, she means Anna in the house. Okay, amen. And then, <laughs> and then there's this other guy named Matt in the dream. And you know what he says to me? Again, God is really nice to me because maybe I don't always understand. He, the guy says, when I'm in your dream, he actually says this, when I'm in your dream, I'm Samuel. That's what he says. I'm Samuel. So I have Anna and Samuel in my dream. And they're giving me all of these things. They're giving me honey. They're giving me bread. They're giving me milk. And they're giving me this CD called The Secret of the Vine. And so it's a, it has jagged edges on it, but it still plays. And it was, it was produced by IHOP and Vineyard which had significance in just how the Lord led. By the way, let me go back to pies really quick. <laughs> I'll come back. When we named Pasadena International House of Prayer, we were not trying to be clever and do it after what God had said. Didn't happen. I wish I could say, yes, I remembered the prophetic word and I tried to do it. But what happened is I wanted it to be called IHOP Pasadena. Like, cause I thought, let's be like everyone else. You put, you put IHOP, and then you put the name of your city. Because I thought, if you, then the, the, the people with me, and it was actually a Jamaican. She was the one who was convincing me of this. She said, no, put the P in front. Let's do, let's do Pasadena International House of Prayer. I said, it sounds like we're conflicted, like Pasadena International, Pasadena. You know, like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And she's like, I, I feel like we should be different. Let's put it in the front. So I, I give in. I said, okay, because then there was another guy, and he was like saying, yeah, let's do that. So I go, okay. I was a little disappointed, to be honest. I was like, I want to be like everyone else. But anyway, so then we do it, and I go to tell the first person. Like, you know, like, oh, we're excited. We named ourselves. So I go, we're the Pasadena International House of Prayer. And they go, that's Pie Hop. And it just hits me. For some reason, we had never tried to do the acronym. We just did it. And I'm like, look at God. That was a year after the dream and, and without us even trying. And I want to just encourage you with the prophetic, you don't have to try. <laughs> you don't have to try. It's God's word. He accomplishes it. We just remain faithful to Jesus every day. And you know what? We hear the voice behind us and we look back and we think, oh, you spoke that. It happened. Look at this. I'm just walking in with God on a daily basis. You don't have to contend to make those things happen. You just stay faithful. You do what Jesus says every day. And you know what? It happens. It happens. It's unbelievable how it happens. And you know what? It makes you even more excited because you knew God did it and not you. It's what we were talking about at the very beginning. He wants to take all glory. He wants to fulfill all the promises that you, you just were in that posture of waiting, and he did it. So then back to um, Samuel and Anna. So in, in this dream, I'm going to this new house. So what I believe Samuel and Anna represent, those are two different generations. It's not Hannah and Samuel. It was Anna and Samuel. So both of them represent ministry unto the Lord. Their first and primary way of being before the Lord was ministering to him. And that is what the house of prayer is mainly about. You would think, oh no, but isn't it about revival and answered prayer? No, it's mainly about ministry unto the Lord. About a God who desires to be known as he has known us. As a God who is worthy to be looked into and to be discovered day and night. That we can consistently come to him and experience him. And that would be, I believe, a sign to many, whoa, who is this God? Who is he that you love him this way? Who is he? 
He's not requiring it, but you're just giving it. Isn't that amazing? That is going to touch many around us. That he's worthy to be ministered to. We don't just use ministry for others. We minister unto him. But then what's powerful about them is that they ministered to others. They not only ministered to God, but they were a voice. They were both prophetic, right? They both prophesied. And so that is what God is desiring, is he's raising up a prophetic generation. And where is he doing that? As they minister to him. I believe prophetic voices, that is where it needs to happen out of. Because otherwise it becomes a stumbling area. If it, it's about you, because a lot of times the prophetic, because it's so weighty, because it has so much revelation, it can stumble people. It can stumble the person doing it. It can stumble the people around them. All of a sudden they feel like they're God, you know, and so, and they're, thus saith the Lord, you know, and like, you must listen to me. I am the voice of God, you know, and that is not where God wants us at. Because if we are ministering unto the Lord first, our primary place is sitting at his feet and just loving on him. And in that place, we receive the prophetic. It comes out a whole different way. And guess what? That's what God is preparing for this generation. That it would come out of a place of ministering to him. And then we just prophesy by accident. Why? Because we are just so familiar with his voice that it just overflows into our lives. And that's who Samuel and Anna are. And guess what? They evangelize too. They began to impact their culture. Samuel was the one who transitioned his whole culture from going from judges to kings. Anna was in the midst of a, a transition too, right? From kings unto the Messiah. And so they both are part of transitional generations. And guess what? They're both genders. And guess what? They're both ages. They're old and young. And God is saying this is for everyone. It's for male, female, old, young. And God wants to raise those who minister to the Lord first. And I feel like this is such a word, even for this area, that God is longing that you just minister to him, that our ministry would flow out of primarily ministering unto him. Because we've started to have a picture of ministers as only being those who serve people, who are a voice of God who serve people. But God says, no, let ministry first be just ministering unto me. And let many people see you ministering unto God. I believe that just as I lead a house of prayer, one of the most powerful things I can do is be in the prayer room. It's not my teaching. It's being in the prayer room and ministering to God alongside many others. It begins to transform the way people see ministry. It's awesome. Okay, amen. So the third dream was that this woman named Joanne McFadder, who's a prophetic singer, she was one of the first prophetic singers in Kansas City years and years ago in the 80s. And in the dream, she's giving a seminar. And the seminar ends, and just like every, you know, everyone leaves, right? The seminar's over, now leave. But I stay. And she, come, she looks at me, and she says, come here. And then I come, cl I come close, and she goes, if they only knew, I will stay as long as they stay. And that was the end of the dream. So I write out the dream, and as I'm writing it out, I see Joanne McFadder, and the Lord just says, Master of Ceremonies, Jesus, Father. He says, Jesus, Father, Joanne McFadder. And then in the middle is the MC. He goes, I want to be the Master of Ceremonies. I want to be the head of the church. I want this place in my body. I want to determine how the order goes. Okay, amen. But you know what I mean? That's, that's a, 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 so in the house of prayer, um, why is it a prophetic singer saying this to me? I believe it's about this place of just endless worship. Endless worship and a, a place where he can linger as we linger. And I believe what he's saying is there's a lingering worship that he's bringing into, our, in, into every sphere. And I feel like the Lord is raising up prophetic singers 
those who will sing spontaneously as we sing, right? That we don't just sing hymns and, and we don't just sing, um, you know, known songs, but we sing straight from our heart. And God is longing for this. But more importantly, Isaiah 4, 2. It says, the branch of the Lord shall be made known. Like, it says, shall be revealed. And all, like, that's not it. I'm almost quoting it right. The branch of the Lord shall be seen as beautiful and glorious. His fruit as excellent and appealing. I also was quoting Isaiah 40, verse 5. It says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it. And I believe that the Lord wants to be known and he wants to be the main attraction. What brings people, it's not because we have really fancy posters or we have really good advertisements or we have really good speakers or we have really good some things. He wants to draw his people. He wants to be the main attraction. I believe we are being prepared that Jesus Christ would be seen for who he is and that would draw men. That would draw men. We wouldn't have to dress him up and make him look fancy. We could just show him for who he is and people would be drawn. But guess what, church? We first have to know who he is. We have to know his glory. And when I say glory, it's the inside of him. Man looks on the outside, but God, he looks on the inside. And he desires a people who are like him, who don't just look on the outside of God and makes like, oh, this is what he does. That must be who he is. No, we take the time to look inside of him. Ha, <laughs> ha. To look inside of him. And as we look inside of him, this is his glory. This is his glory. The glory of God being manifested on the outside, it feels so good. But that's his inside being made known outside. In heaven, he gets to do this all the time. The inside of God is being made known on the outside. But for us, we peer into his glory by looking inside of him. And my friends, that takes time. He's not in a hurry. He's not in a hurry. He doesn't just, you know, don't you come to him and want a quick answer? And he starts talking about something completely different. You're like, no, God, did you hear me? (laughs) We're talking, I want this right here. He's way over here. He's like that. He is not in a hurry. And so there is a patience in waiting upon the Lord. And that is the house of prayer movement. That's what is being called forth when we say, come and be in a room with other believers and wait. And as we wait, let's fall in love. Let's fall in love. (laughs) Amen. The fourth dream was about the eyes of Daniel. In the dream, a man named Daniel was in the dream. It was a person I knew from a long time ago, and his eyes were just staring, constant stare, and it was just so noticeable. I don't know when I wake up out of the dream, I don't know what it means. I start writing it out, and he says, the eyes of Daniel will be manifested in the house of prayer. What is the eyes of Daniel? Well, he's one who understood... (laughs) He understood riddles, enigmas. He was excellent in wisdom and understanding. He was given skill to understand. So I'm from a place, you know, I'm from the L.A. area. Pasadena is just 10 minutes outside of Los Angeles. And guess what? (laughs) We're like Babylon. We are. It's just like Babylon. I'm not kidding. There's Babylonian gods on Hollywood and Highland. We have them, and they're they're five stories tall. They really are literally Babylonian gods. They're from a, one of the original movies called The Birth of a Nation, which had to do with Babylon. So yes, we, th- th- it's a Babylonian age. If you come to Los Angeles, people are so spiritual. It's kind of like here. People are really, you know, open. They're open to all types of things. They're open to receive from all types of places. Well, guess what? God is raising up Daniels in this hour. And the only way to influence in the midst of a Babylonian culture is to be prophetic. Is to have, Daniel was excellent. He was amazing. And I encourage everyone, be excellent in whatever you do. But it's not enough. You will not influence culture through just being excellent. 
You're an excellent doctor. That's amazing. You're an excellent banker. That's amazing. But guess what? You won't influence unless you know the voice of the Lord and you speak into it. Isn't that awesome? And that he influenced because he knew the voice of God. He did not influence because he was just excellent. In a Babylonian culture, you're either influencing or being influenced. I'm sorry, you cannot stay in neutral ground. You're either an influencer or you are being influenced. Your mind starts to think like the Babylonian culture unless you stay intimate with the voice of God. And so that is part of the heart of even the house of prayer that I'm involved in is we're equipping people. not Because a lot of people have come to Los Angeles to get famous. But guess what? They go in there and they just get chewed up and spit out. <laughs> Hurt. Just pushed and, and, and changed because of coming in there and not staying intimate with the Lord. And or not even knowing how to be intimate with the Lord. Many of them have come in as just good Christians, but they don't have intimacy. And that is what God is calling forth when he calls forth the eyes of Daniel. He's saying, I want you to be a people who watch and pray. And as you do this, you will be given words to say that will influence those around you. Because all of you have been put in places of influence. It doesn't matter where you are. You are there to influence. You are there to affect that atmosphere with the kingdom of God. And you must, the only way you can do it is through the voice of God. Isn't that awesome? And you all can do it. And that's what part of the heart of the house of prayer too is that we would equip people to stay intimate with the Lord. Amen. I get really excited. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and with that, I just want to I want to say one more thing about the eyes of Daniel. He said in um, in Daniel, I was Daniel fourteen or Daniel twelve. It's Daniel twelve. He said that in the latter days you will understand this perfectly. And he was talking about what was given in the book of Daniel. It's the latter days, folks. And I believe God is giving understanding into what is happening. He's giving understanding to the book of Daniel. He's giving understanding. Isn't it awesome? It's not for one person. It's for the body. That we would understand the timing of history that we live in and we'd be able to speak in it. We would not be offended by what God is doing. We would not be hurt by what the Lord is doing. But we would move with him in whatever he's doing. Because I'm telling you, the kindest thing that the Lord has done for America in the last 10 years is give us economic distress. It's the kindest thing ever. Why? Because he brought us into a wilderness. And why? Because he wants to remove the bales out of our lives. Because we have become so arrogant that we think we can do it without him. <laughs> and guess what? We can't. And we're finding out we have no solutions for the problems that are in our midst. And guess what? He's wooing a country back to himself. But many would say, oh, this is of the devil. He meant us to be blessed. No, this is a season he is wooing us as a country, and it is the hand of the Lord. It is the hand of the Lord. <laughs> it's so the hand of the Lord. Amen. Okay. <laughs> because even with that, I'll just say, the first year I was in the house of prayer, I was given a dream on 9-9 of 2001. 9-9. Nine, nine. And in the dream, I was given, I saw, <laughs> I saw, um, we were having a military parade. America, having a military parade. I was so, what is going on? We don't put tanks down in the middle of our streets. And in the dream, I saw this and I, 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 I was so hurt by it because I was thinking, are we like Russia now? Who are we? And so then I, I saw these two buildings, and I knew our dignitaries were in those buildings. And then all of a sudden, we shot off four bombs. I didn't know why we shot them off, but we shot them off. And they went through our own buildings. And then the buildings stood, and then they fell. And I looked down, and there was a set of twins at the bottom. So very similar to what actually happened. So when it actually happened, I was like, oh, God, I wish I would have prayed more. I didn't understand. I, it's like when I heard that, um, oh, I know, oh, I forgot one main part. In the dream, I heard a voice, and I heard him say, we have aligned with our enemies. And so 
I was like, who are our enemies? I didn't know America had enemies, really, to be honest. I know, that's funny too. <laughs> but I didn't. I was like, Russia? Is Russia our enemy? I couldn't figure out. This is, you know, 2001. Um, but so when, when this all happens, I realized a lot of people didn't say this. A lot of people would have just said, because we had George Bush as our president, they would have just said, oh, this is a bad thing that happened to us. But I clearly heard that it was judgment. I clearly heard it. That we had aligned with our enemies. And guess who that was? Greed. <laughs> it was greed. Those two buildings represented greed. That's the World Trade Center. It's where all this greed happens. And God was saying, because you have aligned yourself with greed, you have left yourself open. <laughs> anyway, that's not a popular message. I didn't get on the radio saying it. <laughs> But that is what the Lord is going to give to us. Understanding of what is happening in our midst. God does not want us disillusioned in the midst of whatever he's doing in the midst of our world. He wants to give us clarity. And he wants us to first be citizens of heaven before we're the citizens of our own country. <laughs> I mean, it's not easy to hear something bad about your country. It is not easy. Especially for America, maybe. <laughs> but we, I, I, I've, I've been praying, I had prayed for years, God, I want to be your citizen before I am the citizen of this country. And therefore, that I may hear what you are doing and I may agree with you. Because wouldn't it be awful out of national pride that we couldn't know what the Lord was doing in our nation? Out of our own national pride, we, we were kept from hearing what the Lord is doing in our nation. So amen, may this happen. And that is part of what God is releasing through a house of prayer. And even if you say, oh, well, I do this, this, and this. I can't work. At, I can't be full time in a house of prayer. It's okay. Join them in some way. Be involved in it. The reason why I'm saying it is because for Jamaica to have this, I don't know, there's something so special that God has chosen you in this island area to have a house of prayer. It is. It's special. And the reason why I'm saying it is because it's everywhere. We went to Turkey this year. There's a house of prayer there. We went to Tajikistan. There's a house of prayer there. I mean, there are houses of prayer filling the earth. And that you are a church that's associated with the house of prayer, it's a big deal. Because God is wanting to, to bring this forth. And these are the reasons. The last dream had to do with Asaph, who is a gatherer. Okay? Well, the gatherer, that's, what, what that meant in my dream is that it would take time to gather the people. And that God means it to be small for a season. And so for me, um, I'm going to go back to, you would have lost heart unless you believe. You see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. <laughs> because for me, what happened is, I'm in, I'm in the prime of my leadership, just feeling like, God, you prepared me for this hour. Amen. Now you're giving me visions. You're giving me dreams. Amen. We're going to do this. So I'm in it for, I think, five years. Okay, five years, we'll give my, I'll give myself to it, and the Lord will do it. Five years come, and I'm telling you, the house of prayer is smaller than when it began. Okay, it's so small. And guess what? Our worship leaders, they sing off key. We only have two, and they don't sound very good. Oh, this is my life, you guys. I have given myself to it. And I am now in a room where there's off-key worship happening, and it's really painful. And I'm thinking, God, really? I could have done so much for you. And he's like, <laughs> and here I am. And guess what? I can't get myself out of it. Since I left my job, guess what? They don't have teachers. They don't need teachers right now. In fact, they're firing teachers, you know? Like, so I'm thinking, okay, there's nowhere for me to turn. <laughs> Here I am. I'm in a room, and it's not even a pretty room. It's kind of a messy room. It's kind of an ugly room. I think it's, you know, to be honest, I thought it was beautiful, but people would walk in, and they would go, oh, oh. <laughs> It's like, it's like you having an ugly baby, and you think the baby's so beautiful, and you're like, isn't this baby beautiful? And everybody's like, oh, 
Uh huh. <laughs> That's me, folks. That was me. Here I am. I'm five years in, and this thing is pathetic. It's small. It's painful. <laughs> And yet, I stay. Why do I stay? Because he gave a promise. And why do I stay? Because I'm still encountering a heart. I'm still really deeply in love. So I'm loving him, but I'm thinking, you brought me into a really painful thing. It's like, you know, when you get married and you think it's going to be this, and now it's become this, but you really love them. And you're like, I can't leave you, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> so that's, that's the same thing. I was in that place, and he had made it so small. And guess what? It's his, that is God's way. Whatever that promise is, it's going to get ugly. It's going to look so awful. It's going to look like death sometimes, like, oh, Lord. In fact, you're just like, you don't, like, I remember for one whole year, I wanted to lock the door and never come back. I kept plotting how I could never come back. <laughs> Every year, I mean, every day, and not every year, it was every day, I would lock that door and think, oh, I don't want to come back here. And I would come back the next day. <laughs> it really was. And that is you carrying a promise from the Lord. Whatever that promise is, it gets a lot worse before it gets a lot better. And that is the purposes of God. That's not because you're doing anything wrong. When he said, hey, I'm opening up the Red Sea, it's so fun that they had that amazing victory, right? I had that for a little bit too. I was like, God, you've given me so much favor. It's so awesome. And all of a sudden that favor just went away. <laughs> just floated away. <laughs> And then I'm in a wilderness, right? And like, you know, he didn't say, and I'm going to take you to a wilderness. He said, I'm going to take you to a promised land. <laughs> but guess what? You're in a wilderness. And it's just you and him and him and you and some off-key worship leaders. And it's really hard. And some really weird people. I mean, some really weird people came. Really strange. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I mean, it was discouraging, very discouraging. But guess what? <laughs> you stay faithful in the midst of it. You keep loving him. Because guess what? It becomes about him. And you start losing the promise. It just starts dying in your midst. It's like a seed that just fell, and it just starts dying. And all that attachment you had towards it, it just you start losing it. You don't have it anymore. It's not as attached. It's not all life is hanging on to that one promise. Unless you do that promise, I don't know what will happen. No, now I'm more connected to him. He's got me wrapped around his little finger. He's got me wrapped around his little finger. He has to let it linger. And guess what? When I said you're in good company, read this. He never gave a vision and then did it. He gives vision and he lets it linger. He lets it linger. They wait and wait and wait. And so I waited and waited and waited. So 2001, now it's 2009. It's still kind of hard. Still very painful. <laughs> Remember I said five years. Remember? <laughs> five. Then I'd be moving on. Maybe I'd be sent as a missionary to Africa. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to make impact. And so it's five years, no, now it's 2009, that's eight years, and the Lord is still lingering. And then it begins to shift. All of a sudden, God begins to draw these people, and the, the weird ones just leave. They just left. <laughs> I was so grateful. I was like... <laughs> They just left. And, um, <laughs> and that off-key worship leader, he just left too. <laughs> there's, a, there's some more behind that. But anyway, and so then uh, God begins to release these amazing worship leaders to us. And then more come and more come. And now this house of prayer, <laughs> which again, I want to just say, when the Lord builds it, it's slow, folks. If you let him do this dream, if you let him do this promise, it's a slow build. He's not a fast builder. He's like that one who does 
so, you know, you're like, really? It's still taking so long to do that renovation or whatever. He's one of those guys who takes forever. He takes all these breaks. You're like, God. <laughs> you're, it's, it's so long. But if he, it's him. And you want something that is him and not yourself. Because when it's you who does it, you have to keep it up. When it's him who does it, he keeps it up. He keeps it up. He keeps it up. All the pressure comes off of you. It's his. It's no longer yours. You come away and you know it's only him who did it. Because by the time he started blessing us, I didn't think I could lead anyone. Literally, I thought, God, I feel so weak. I feel so broken. I feel so incapable of anything. And he said, perfect. Perfect. That's exactly where I wanted you. Because I don't want flesh to boast. Uh, if you're going to boast, boast that you know me. Don't boast in your riches. Don't boast in your might. Don't boast in your mind. But boast that you know me. That you know me. That you know me. And that's what every promise that you're carrying is mainly for. It's mainly that you would know the Lord. That you would know him. And now, all of a sudden, we're this house of prayer that there's only 12 in the, in, in, in the United States that go over 50 hours of live worship. And we're one of them. And guess what? We go, I don't know, I can't always remember, but I think we do 120 hours of live worship. How did this happen? One off-key worship leader. And now we have 120 hours a week of worship that's going up before the throne of God. I did not do that, folks. The Lord did it. The only thing I did was stay faithful and just wait. Wait. And, don't, and didn't get in a hurry to try to build it. I, anyway, I couldn't have even done it because there was no ability to do it. And that's what's going to happen. You're going to see this happen here. As in the waiting, you're, you know, because you might next year think, well, I thought we were going to do 24-7. <laughs> I thought we were doing 24-7. Aren't we doing 24-7? Why is it not 24-7? Because when the Lord builds, it's a slow build. <laughs> and you know what? It could happen next year. And awesome. And I want to say one last thing. Am I okay? It's 1030. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> I'm not okay. <laughs> One last thing, though. Okay. Hebrews 11. About faith. Because you know what happens? When you remain faithful, you get filled with faith. <laughs> Verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then he begins, to, he, get, he begins to share lives, people's lives. Guess what they are? They're the substance of what you've been hoping for. They're the evidence of what has been unseen. Each of you can become substance for someone else. Each of you can become evidence. Oh, that's what I was hoping for. That's what I hadn't seen, but now I have seen it because I saw your life. You have remained faithful. And now if you remain faithful, guess what? He does it. And so that's why you stay on the journey. Whatever God has called you to, there's people behind you. And they need to see that if you stay faithful, that he does it. And guess what? They're given courage to stay on that path of faith. I get excited because I feel that's what we're all for, we're made for. We're made to influence the next generation, whoever they are. You, all of you have one, and you will become the evidence they were hoping for. You know we all have those. I have some in my own life. I looked at their lives, and I was looking, I was watching, and I was seeing, does it work? And they became evidence. It does. And that's what each of you, you all have a sphere that you will inspire many because you remain faithful. Amen. And you walked the journey and you held on to the promise and you did not lose heart. You took courage and you waited on the Lord. Amen. Okay, let me just pray. Can I pray? So, Father, I just thank you. I thank you for each one in this room. 
and that you desire that they would know you. Therefore, you have given them promises that they are waiting for. I ask that, God, you would kiss them with the kisses of your word, that you would romance them with your own heart, God. They would know you in greater ways. And I pray, God, even today, God, release courage to keep believing, to keep hoping, to keep trusting, to keep watching, to keep waiting, God. I ask, God, release faith even now in this room. And God, I ask that for those who came in just feeling weak, that God, you would just now strengthen them. I pray that these words that were spoken, they wouldn't just be nice stories, but they would, God, release strength to your people. And I bless them, God. I thank you that in this region, you will establish your house of prayer. And God, that there will be night and day worship. And it will influence many nations. Many will come. Many will come. They will come and they will experience the Lord here in this place. They will experience the Lord in this region. God has called this region as a, as a place where people will encounter honor the Lord and they will go out in faith believing that the Lord will do it in their region. I really believe that God is going to use this place. Therefore, he is establishing night and day prayer because people will be drawn here and they will encounter this church. They will encounter many things and they will experience the Lord. Thank you, God. I just bless each one in Jesus name. Amen.